Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingster. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders and entrepreneurs in the hospitality industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out. The kind that both employees and customers love and support. In today's podcast, we have a very, very special guest, Brian Moore. Brian is a global retail analyst, trainer and writer in all aspects of the high street. Brian is the CEO of EMR NAM News Limited, a daily and monthly news service that covers national, European and global retailers. You can check out his blog at camcityblog.com. We sat down with Brian to talk about his story, the relationship between retail and hospitality, Amazon, Dark Kitchen and the state of our beloved high street and the future ahead so grab pen and paper coffee strap in and enjoy welcome to the hospitality maverick podcast brian thank you very much for joining us today thank you for asking me really truly looking forward to it brian we met here at uh, platform nine we fall in to talk about the uh, retail hospitality and, sure. and the challenge within that good and uh, suddenly I learned that you didn't only have a couple of years of experience, you had a lifetime of experience and then you can tell how many years yourself. <laughs> and we came into a really interesting conversation about where are we going in general in the industry and we're going to cover yeah, that sure. later. But I think it'd be really good for, for people out there just yes, to sir. know who is Brian, where does he come from and what is it that you're doing today? My parents were mom and papa grocers in Dublin and so I learned retailing grocery particularly from above the shop again through actually standing behind the counter and dealing with customers so that came naturally I guess then when I was old enough I was delivering to houses with the, what we call in Dublin messages but in fact groceries and again got a feeling for what Amazon are now achieving very well nowadays I officially then went to college learning engineering and basically there got a feeling for numbers so for that I felt a great benefit in applying numbers to every aspect of the if you like supplier retailer relationship I was also became disenchanted with engineering because I, during my summer holidays I used to come to London and work on the buildings and found that the guy making most money on the site was the making good man who was correcting mistakes and covering up issues etc for the clerk of works on behalf of that building and quality management so I said being idealistic, to hell with engineering, and basically I will do something else. So I became a medical representative, so I knew a bit about pharmaceuticals and took advantage of that knowledge, and basically I became, for the first time, really interested in selling, because I found myself selling to doctors who don't usually use the product themselves, to use it on someone that I could never get to, and equally the NHS was paying for it. So we had a three-part dynamic in selling, which intrigued me in the whole persuasion process in terms of what needs to be done. So with that in mind, I began to study and marketing became more and more interesting and attractive, etc. So I set up EMR NAM News about 40 years ago. At the time, people were saying that basically Roll is a 55-year shelf life, which I assumed was about the business rather than the age of me they were talking. So from that point of view, I keep blazing on regardless and was only yesterday celebrated that figure through LinkedIn etc so intriguing but that was it what I tried to do is help clients so I actually bridge the gap between supply and retail I work for retailers and suppliers and, and try to get very close to that idea but basically I concentrated on fast-moving consumer goods it seemed the more interesting there were the products and brands my parents had on the shelves etc and really began to think of that plus toiletries into the multiples and boots branches into like Tesco, Sainsbury, Ma Morrison's and Asda. Okay and in those days with the clients who are people like Kraft Foods etc the whole idea of food service was was very much an add-on and a very alien type of business. There were no, at that time, and we're talking a long time ago, uh, no real measures that were quite common in uh, dealing with FMCG to consumers. So the opportunity for me was in my relationship with hospitality, if we want to broaden it that way, was to somehow take some of the disciplines of FMCG back into that area. And that seemed to work for the clients that got me involved in that type of thing. Basically, I then began to see the crossover between retail and hospitality, for instance, in terms of measures, which are quite common in retail, like sales per square foot, basket size, repeat purchase, etc. 
and sat down and said, right, if they just simply apply that, like the square footage of a restaurant, the number of tables, the table turn, the revenue per table, repeat meal, and especially the idea of getting people back, because in, in FMCG, it is a highly unprofitable business in terms of getting the first trial, as you know. In other words, the cost of a new product of getting someone to actually take that first bite is so expensive Basically, uh, you lose money on the first one. Only if they're more than satisfied and come back a second time, with a slightly less encouragement, i.e. more profit, do you break even. And it's on the third visit to the brand that you really begin to make money. And then you hook them in, providing you always give cliche, but more than it says on the tin. Right, right, right that's the way to run this business. I can be of value to both sides in that respect, both supply and retail on the one hand, and equally FMCG primarily, but equally in food service as it was then and that's how it all came so that was me we go on as long as I live and uh, basically <laughs> I have no intention of passing it on to anybody and no need to and probably not possible but essentially that's how I got to where I am what you do in a way is that unlocking the, the knowledge gap they would have themselves you're looking at the business differently from a strategic point of view yeah. and challenging a bit of what they're doing already I believe fundamentally in the individual and in the business having all of this already it's just helping them recognize is basically seeing a need because of this unprecedented global financial crisis people are down to firefighting looking for today and focus quite closely on it but distracted by the pressures and I have to try to persuade them to see it a little more in the future and to apply numbers to it in terms of annual reports etc etc as being the only way they can convince outside the lenders and ultimately any institutions they need help from. If they don't do all that it's great the enthusiasm but it gets nowhere eventually given this terribly unprecedented environment we're in in that respect. Yeah. Coming away back to hospitality and retail, yes, yeah. I think it's, it's two industries or sectors that mm. in the same storm, in sure. a way. Yeah, sure. What do you see that's going on right now? Because I guess you have seen ups and downs yes. through your career. What is so different with this one, or is it actually different? Yeah, it is very different. As I say, I've worked through three major recessions. It took the world a long time to admit that this was a recession. Politicians are still denying it. But effectively, this is the most complicated one. It's the most serious one. But like all recessions, it has an end point and peaks out of this. Otherwise, everything is over. But effectively, I have a firm belief that we just have to change our mode of action uh, now in terms of what has come from 2008 is a flatline demand, which is difficult for people to accommodate in their thinking, planning, etc., etc. And in those circumstances, I've seen from experience, the growth is still there if you've got unique creativity and other focus in terms of consumer satisfaction, ultimately, and then go for the competitor who's not doing that, and that's your gap. Work out realistically a relative competitive appeal versus a available competitors in the market and shape up an offering that if you like is unique given those restraints in that respect yeah you say it's very different from from yeah. the others besides you know politics everybody can see that that's yeah, changed sure. dramatic over the years but what is different in, in in the markets i guess that also there will be still be scope to growth because yeah, everybody sure. talks about growth and yeah. that's sometimes you know ceos have like yeah, a couple sure. of jobs one yeah, of them sure. is growth yes yeah, sure. another one is profit yes yeah, sure. compliance and yeah. then innovation yeah Right, I will put a little restraint on some of that in the yeah. sense I'm always careful to check out the age group of the people I'm actually talking to. So if I'm talking to people coming towards retirement, they just want a smooth run to the last bit, i.e. two or three years. Anyone younger than that is say, right, you've got to do something with this business because you're too young to retire. And so from that point of view, they're the ones who will make real change. The older ones won't and cannot, and so in terms of the way they're remunerated, etc. So we get them to think differently, get them thinking of growth being, if you like, innovation for sure, but not so far removed from the basic offering that it's un unrecognizable and you hold a new education job, and education is expensive in terms of media, etc., etc. But effectively, given the right circumstance, being able to translate what they do into a good investment package in that respect for those who either have to lend or actually invest or people invest their career in it. So one man would have to say, what I need to be able to describe this like the old elevator pitch, but effectively succinctly as a way of being a way forward for various 
various stakeholders and then reshaping it to accommodate that as truly as one can. So you see that the leaders, the CEOs or the management or yeah. business owners, small to large one in retail hospitality, they stand up against one of maybe the most complex challenges yeah. they, they would ever have. And I can remember one of the conversations we had, we talked a bit about, it seems like it's a bit red ocean everywhere now, maybe that maybe not that many blue oceans. Yeah, there was no, no, which totally. It is the same everywhere in the sense that we're talking about geographical experience, we're talking about economic We're talking about type of industry, sector, and even category, okay? They're all going through being forced to face facts of, if you like, lower demand, where consumers and the various, as they call them, stakeholders, effectively, are paying down debt rather than spending. So we got to get used to this flatline way of doing things. Unfortunately, those very CEOs you mentioned are coming from probably being educated, leaving college about, about 20, 30 years ago, at a time when we didn't have anything like flatline, so from that point of view they couldn't. They've not been educated to it. I've been in meetings years ago and uh, we would spend the whole afternoon looking at strategies as we thought, brainstorming everything else. Basically now it's firefighting and emergency treatment very focused with a retail environment and I guess hospitality buying in environment that will not allow anybody to get even a slightest price increase when one needs price increase to do the things one needs is committed to do, then mistakes occur. And mistakes occur like horse meat somehow getting into beef burgers, which can never happen in normal life, but in practice by forcing down the ability of suppliers to absorb and get cost increases through that echo the costs coming through their pipeline, there are prices to pay. And because of the firefighting and lack of focus on the future, then people will be, again, forced to move too quickly, hence errors are made. Then have to be handled or distracting, etc. And if we don't handle them, you're taken over by someone who thinks they can. And so that's the dilemma these people have. So it's not only just selling products, satisfying consumers, but trying to run a business in what can be crisis situations. You know, it doesn't leave much time for thinking about the blue sky. We all call it tough times. And yeah, some, yeah. some in, if we come back to the Different. hospitality and restaurant sector, we've yeah. seen people go into CG, CGAs and yeah, sure. administration yesterday from Patricia Valerie, so one of the big, 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 big players in, in the market as mm -hmm. well, employing a lot of people. We saw something happening last year as well. Do you think we've seen the last of that? Toys Ross as well earlier yeah, sure, this year. No, no. And you haven't mentioned the villain in the piece or the one who's taken credit for causing all that, Amazon. Amazon itself is in fact a disruptor, but not because they price low versus others, etc. What they're doing is revealing old, well past sell by business models. So from that point of view, departmental stores, for instance, are something from the 1850s, managed to struggle into the 1920s, and since then have been struggling. They were designed for a time when people had help in shopping, they had someone else parking and were collecting and, and taken care of all the way through the process. It's totally impossible now. So they're all in the wrong place. They're too big, they're too modular, and thieving, which is normally 2% of any retail sales, is huge in these areas. So that pulls away any uh, real profit potential they have. So you've got the high spots like something like Selfridges, Harrods, etc., in their flagship stores doing reasonably well because of other issues. But effectively, the departmental store is dead and it's just taking time to kill it. Debenhams will go very shortly, House of Fraser effectively gone. When it comes to something like Toys R Us, again, you're talking about very dynamic industry toys, and that was, a, if you like, a aggregator of all possible toy offerings in one piece as a semi-wholesaler, etc. That worked pretty well. But again, the pressure, once you change the theme of a toy, provision in that respect the, the problem will be that they just can't make enough money to survive people like amazon looking all the time for industries or sectors that are lazy have had it too easy and it just this guy bezos is just ticking off one after another and only a question time becomes it gets to hospitality 
and does that in Bretton Commons seriously but at the moment not it's just in the, some of the food supply part of it but that his big one will be later on when he decides he can run a better restaurant than anybody and I think already they're testing restaurants in the US yeah. because they have a lot of data on consumers yeah, sure. so they know probably more than the, 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 the average mom and pop and even yeah. chain restaurant yeah. about consumers in themselves so yeah, absolutely he's so consumer centric it is frightening everything is driven from the consumer appetite point of view he says basically sell anything that can legally be sold to anybody anywhere anytime and that'll be the planet earth at the moment okay but the guy has the sky is the limit in terms of where he's going he goes in to industry sectors that either old inefficient etc and to everyone's surprise goes straight to the heart of it leaves out everything else and uh, is more or less successful doesn't have to show profit, so he's cross-subsidizing from his cloud services and various others, so that will take care of that bit. But as you say, rightly, in the process he's learning about every habit every consumer has and is meeting that need better than anyone else that has ever done so. And goes into junk mail, for instance. I resent anything hitting my desk or on my screen that is, in fact, not relevant to my needs. I never object to an Amazon mail out of whatever type because it's, I realize I needed more XYZ for the garden or whatever. And that is so perfectly done. As I say, it's intimidating, even frightening for those who don't know where to start in terms of consumer satisfaction. That's a huge issue. Will there be another Amazon? You do think is there an Amazon number two coming out there that will compete with Amazon because they they in a way I would say they almost control that market. Yeah, he's been twenty years in it. He's started online, and I'm talking about Jeff Bezos, obviously. Um, he's set the standards for performance in terms of one-click ordering, turning around and fulfillment within uh, twenty-four hours. It was, but in the let's say M25 ring can be within four hours and you can then send back as easy as ordering which is incredible what he's ignoring is the high costs of refunding and that would be a slight deterrent but certainly is an obstacle for anybody else in retail trying to go online on the competition he already has very active competitors and the main one is Alibaba of course okay who have managed to do what he's doing and are spreading out from China to the rest of the world on the back of computer services, of IT services of all types, and making real money. He is not making money because it's more useful for him to reinvest everything into the business and grow the business, keeps his corporation tax at a minimum, etc. Alibaba, for whatever reason, are hitting the bottom line with reasonably proper profits so they won't have the attention of governments looking for some of that our friends Amazon will have so they'll be distracted Amazon will be distracted in the future by having to account for themselves but at the moment very little profit no big corporation tax issue but huge like interest on the part of every country in the world as to we want a slice of what happens in our country don't care how you do it with offshoring etc etc we want some of that the Americans want the most being they have corporation tax rate of 36 percent so it's handy for these guys to be outside Yahoo and various and Google etc in other countries where it's more like 20 percent etc but that doesn't stop Mr. Trump for instance wanting to pull some of that back on shore. So if we should look at any you know business you know say we talked about there was the, the red ocean and not yeah. much blue ocean to explore out there. Yeah, sure. Is there anyone that does really well in this when it comes to retail and hospitality? Is there some example of you know companies who say they still do incredible well or have prepared for this, have seen it coming yeah. and are ready ready for this challenge over the next couple <laughs> of years where the, where growth's gonna be quite flat and maybe even you know downwards. Right. And the people seem to be tailor-made for this at the discounters, Aldi and Lidl, and they've gone up market on all the things that they were not doing when they started 40 years ago, as it happens. I've been in shops in Frankfurt 20, 30 years ago and just couldn't believe that something like that could ever work here. But I could see what they were doing because the one thing impressed me at the time was uh, outside the shop, customers had parking outside the shop ranging from students' bicycles to top-of-scale Mercedes, you know, so that right they've got that spread of customers come back and they're looking for value for money 
come into the UK, it's wide open, and they did come in, and it was, was wide open, totally underestimated by the professional retailers, saying that's down, market's common, will never suit our local. Then we had 2008 comes crashing in, and these are going like wildfire. They're going, growing is at 12, 15%, compared with Tesco struggling to go a little, maybe like for like, at a 1 or 2%, no comparison and uh, no contest, and that's what's happening. So you have that on the one hand, the discounters, which is incredibly good value for money, very transparent offerings. Suppliers begrudgingly like them because basically it's a very straight deal. They don't have huge investment in advertising, etc. It's just put it all into the price and they reflect that in what's on the shelf. So you got that, the quality, people will then come back and do all the FMCG things one tries to do with consumers. Add that to an Amazon creating a online efficiency that others can copy and you have a huge slug of retail taken care of and that's where the growth is. There are small one-man band innovative type retailers etc which if it's good enough are soon copied by other people are aggregators into bigger retailers attempts etc and that's probably the same with small restaurants which is a highly personal business and the ambition to grow means that you're diluting the influence of the owner as you get bigger and bigger and you were mentioning in previous conversations with me 50 to 100 outlets being probably the limit i would say 10 to 20 to get that closeness and then the option is for anybody running a good hospitality outlet is basically either perfect the formula and the controls etc and franchise it okay that's one way or put your managers and staff on profit share not aggressively enough to make them cut costs so much that consumers don't come but enough to run the business as if it was their own so it has to be a generous profit share and that will support a model that will go out to probably a hundred thousand outlets if you get the formula right but constantly remodeling that formula to meet changing needs of sophistication one thing that's come out of this recession and especially 2008 onwards is the emergence of a savvy consumer so a savvy consumer as you know will be someone who wants demonstrable value for money and will settle for nothing less that savvy buying has gone right through supply chain right through to buyers etc and equally owners of restaurants cafes and hotels etc so exactly the same thing everybody is lifting up the lid and counting which they took for granted before and that is one enormous change you mean to then right i got to remodel my offering cut out any extraneous material and pieces so i'm left with what these people think they're in here to buy and i give them a little more than they expected it's a magical formula. So what you're saying, Brian, in a way, yeah. is it's going to be even harder to yeah. build change as yes. we go forward. The one that makes it will have a very special formula. They yeah. have refined, not over a couple of years, but mm. maybe years and years and years. Yes, and, and a good example I always like to talk about, and, and a lot of people talk about, is Pret. Yes, sir. Been sold and bought a couple of times, but still yes, continue sir. performing yeah. quite well. And what, what do you think a company like Pret got right on that journey because they are in, in principle a sandwich shop and there's yeah. a lot of them out there. The key is I think goes back to the consumer opening a sandwich and finding there was more ingredient than they thought, it tastes more consistently better etc, fresher and the formula changes with changing tastes in terms of health food and other etc, food to go and it sort of lasts on the way back to the home or at work etc etc and that ability to think through the buying process and in use process and afterwards in terms of when the people are ready to go again and set it up that that is simplified for them and without any confusing of them or uh, misleading of them uh, basically you just say deep down what is this person here for and what can I do and still make enough money to continue the quality and continue the process because I'm really in it to get them back again on this occasion when I've got them as my way of proving to them that it's worth coming back and that's it and to see life in terms of as a lifetime value of consumer this is exactly what Amazon do by the way they see basically they just want to hook you in by any means whatever and get you started and realizing the convenience of going straight 
open the laptop, see something, buy it, whereas you go to an alternative provider of online, for instance, and basically you get to page four of kind of your blood group being correct and uh, start again, and you close the laptop, you go back over to your mobile and do it with Amazon, you know. And that's the whole thing, the simplicity of ordering. And I do mean one click. They trust, I trust them, they trust me, etc. And that's how it happens. And it managed to do that from selling books from the back of his garage. And 20 years later, it is rather larger in any area that you care to mention. It doesn't matter to this guy or to the public what he sells. For instance, offering can be typically, as Tesco, just because it's so uh, obvious to us, 45,000 SKU stock keeping units and are trying to compete in terms of range with someone like Amazon who have 500 million in the catalogue. 500 million, that is anything I ever conceivably want. All Jeff Bezos has to be careful about is the quality of what's in there because there's some rubbish in that selection. But in general terms, most people come back for more. There's been a bit of a lot of talk about that people in the future will choose companies they will trust and you just talked about trusted will yeah. trust and they want to buy from yeah. do you think any of these massive company like amazon we can take deliveroo uh, yeah, sure. uber and mm-hmm. just eat if we go into the food world which is have a similar business model like amazon do you think they will come into some challenges and we already see airbnb without yeah. wanted to get into these challenges, came into some you know community challenges mm-hmm. and we've seen yeah. uh, Deliveroo there was a program on Panorama a couple of weeks ago about yeah. Deliveroo and, and Just Eat mm-hmm. do you think they, they, they will need to adapt to keep the consumer wanting to come back or do you think it's because it's so easy they will stay on the ease will not be enough the fact that the people are concerned about green issues environmental issues or t- talking about abuse of uh, workers in present country and other countries etc so there are other influences on the process these guys to be have to be whiter than white otherwise they spend so much time compensating for the deficiencies even more than the cost of actually trying to improve it if they keep going back to basics and say what do people really want what do they need and there can be a difference and to what extent can I risk just meeting their wants rather than their needs and all fundamental in consumer marketing and way up that but for sure, anybody, on any time someone asks, I've got to have an answer that is not lib, political and all the normal things, but rather a true statement of what we're trying to do and how we deliver. And ultimately, the only test is that I trust you enough to come back and hand you my wallet, basically, and buy some more. Otherwise, forget that, do something else, rob banks or whatever, but then no way are they going to be able to con a savvy consumer nowadays and you have social media is a way of propagating some of the good and bad of that one thing we say um, call tell a friend for instance if you please me in terms of your offering and what I've got when I open the tin I will tell one friend if you're lucky if you displease me I will try and tell 10 people before I get fed up complaining add social media to that and multiply it by thousands and you see what is happening with kids that are buying and selling, recommending to one another. That has to be addressed. So the only way is to be straight with people and say, basically, at the price you're willing to pay, we can only make it this way. Unless you pay a little more, then we can add the sophistication. But I do not take the shortcut of shrinkflation, whereby, let me say, a Toblerone bar suddenly loses every second mountain in the bar and uh, as yet charging a similar or same price. So from that point of view, the most loyal consumer knows the product or the brand backwards and are the first ones to notice when you're shortchanging them. Why invest what can be 50 years of marketing in getting to that point and throw it away with your best users? You know, and that's what's wrong with, with the lack of trust nowadays because then that person becomes cynical with regard to everything else. Luckily, when they open the other tins of other people, they find they're getting more than, okay, so they're not loyal with these, but they ditch these and they will complain to as many people as possible about it. I spent a lot of uh, years in McDonald's and one of the things we wanted to build was repeat customers or guest transactions. Yes, we do, of course. And and, and we worked quite hard to get that loyalty because there was always always a stigma around, you know, companies like McDonald's this is Marmite yeah, company yeah, you know the most people are eating McDonald's but uh, very few admit it <laughs> <laughs> no okay 
But the copy's pretty good, I'm told, you know. Yeah. I don't trust it enough yet myself. It's quite interesting when, when we were able to build trust around the employer brand yeah. And, yeah. and the quality of food, yeah, which, yeah. which we started doing in, in the years I was there, and it was a very big focus in that. You saw how sales yes, growth right. came. Yes, indeed, yeah. It was not in a new product. That no, it, which it was, it was the consumer actually starting to trust the brand more. Yeah, sure. And we saw it came where there was a big campaign here in the UK about like jobs sure, and yeah. so on. That has grown across the business, and they're trying to do that in the in the US yeah, now. Sure, it's, yeah. it's a big challenge, and it's probably going to be growing, you know, more developed market with it. But they also seem to be able to go through recession on yeah, recession sure. and getting stronger and stronger. Yeah, sure. If definitely, if you look at the share price. No, no, which you're talking about, yeah. yeah. Is that another company that that maybe have because they're massive, they 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 massive. It has thirty six thousand restaurants. Yeah, are they ready for the future? If in in your view, from you know the death of the high street and yeah, you know, which, retail and all this that ties in very nicely with the idea of running a small, very personalised restaurant as opposed to being a mass market one. And the question then becomes one of whether um, you can make money at each. They are just slightly different business models. And I see that the same with independent grocers and with a uh, like of Tesco, Sainsbury, etc. And the basic idea is if you want to make money, and that's a lot of my work is involved in this, is return on capital employed by whatever means. And return on capital employed, as you know, is a factor of margin and rotation of capital. Okay, so you can be like in the cosmetics business, if you like, a very big margin and very slow annual rotation of product. In the mass market retail, you're talking about a narrowish market uh, with a good formula, a narrowish net profit, but fast rotation. Typically, the multiples will be turning their goods over 25 times a year, okay, with a margin that can work at 2%, ideally, should be 5%, but nevertheless, that works. When it comes to individual, highly if you like personalized restaurant if you're that good and they're coming for you personally as long as uh, and with everything else then can possibly charge a little more and thereby get a reasonable net profit but everything will be slower in turning in terms of ingredients stock etc so you won't be buying as much you won't have scale advantages but you will be able to watch the quality of everything you're getting and a good supplier will keep you getting good stuff really for a lot of these owners either the tesco owner equivalent or the actual uh, small individual restaurant. It's a question of saying how fast you want to grow, to what uh, extent, at what risk, at what cost, etc. So that can be mapped out very easily. But essentially, make your mind up, dare I say, about whether you're going to be small, relatively high margin, and very careful but slow rotation, or whether you're going to try and evolve something that can be scaled and go through usually franchising, basically, but eventually can be done, or through the profit share idea I mentioned earlier but the key will be there very narrow margin and rotation and to give you an example for instance beverages and I'm talking about carbonated drinks in a supermarket what could be uh, in the high summer can be turning over three times a day that means to get three deliveries a day okay compared with 25 times a year which is two weeks stock of other things yeah you know. And it can be done because if you put a whole day's supply of, let us say, Coca-Cola into an actual uh, retail establishment, it would absorb a lot of the space that they have need for other things, etc. So they just cannot even cope with holding more than three or four hours stock at high demand times. It's getting to know their business, whatever it is, be it hospitality or retail, in terms of the numbers, what seemed to work over time, and just watching and counting. And it's not very interesting compared with the if you like, art of meal preparation and serving, etc. But it's a fundamental, and you can't forget it, or will not be allowed to forget it for long. So it's seeing numbers, finance, etc., wrapped around your business model, and then use that, what your learnings are in terms of applying that in practice. We touched a bit on the delivery or the whole delivering model. There's been yeah. a lot of talk about that in, in general, for also for supermarket, yeah, the, sure. the growth of delivery business mm. it's going to be massive yes, apparently sir. already are very big both in the uk mm, yeah. and across the globe you talked a bit about growth of flatline is yeah. growth just moving into other ways of doing business then because amazon is a delivery model how is your view on that delivery time and fulfillment is now a competitive edge or basis for one etc so getting either closer physically which goes back to the if you extend the idea of the delivery of dark kitchens is simply moving the art operation 
closer to where big consumption occurs, like big financial districts or anywhere you've got a lot of office workers, then to be able to bring that delivery time down. The problem is uh, people are prepared to pay for that. So if you're delivering groceries, if one ever sees grocery delivery as, as a, a competitive issue, it basically costs about £25 to make one grocery delivery, okay? The most you can ask any consumer to pay is £5, okay? You make a margin of 25% on average on the content, etc., we're still losing 10 quid. So that means, basically, for retailers, there is more profit to be made in brick and mortar business than there is in online. But it's interesting from the city point of view and for everybody, the press, etc. point of view, to be seen to be active in online. And as a result, they're building that side at cost themselves and diluting overall profitability. And that's one has to be very careful that when a restaurant decides to deliver meals, but don't fall into that trap as well. Getting the people into their premises, etc., and satisfying them enough to want to come out in the rain and be there rather than at home and expecting a delivery, which would be slightly lower quality given the travel experience, etc. That's the issue, is online real profitability if people dare to measure it. Deliveroo, by the way, with the dark store idea, to my mind, is just vertical integration. They're getting closer. They're, at the moment, they're an aggregating different restaurants, produ productivity and production into a, a, what could be a storage canister, etc., near a centre of consumption. Eventually, they begin to say, right, we can do some of this ourselves better and begin to build a branch that is an encompassing also preparation of the meal and becoming unique itself. And that's the threat from Deliveroo because it becomes so good at every aspect of it, their ambition will grow in terms of going further up the chain to buying raw material, ingredients and cooking it themselves and um, being able to hold their consumer base through trust enough to be able to get them to accept that proposition at a reasonable price. Do you think they will go in and open restaurants in, you know, there's this restaurant leaving the high streets now as yeah. part of, you know, the death of the high street. Sure. Do you think they will be one of the, the new... Because is the high street going to die or is it just going to transform? That's the, that's the probably the big question. And who is then coming in? Is it mm -hmm. Amazon, Deliveroo, yeah. these people yeah. that really have all the data to know exactly? In this location, also Thai food, in this over there, yeah. also Indian, here is pizza, yeah. Oh, yeah. because I know that's going to work from the data. And the ability to change that, depending on the taste for Indian, yeah. changing it, etc., etc., that will happen to a certain extent. But the inherent weaknesses of the high street are about business rates and essentially that parking difficulties and all of that. Uh, so that's one problem. And there's local councils have to get into their heads the idea that that has got we've got to make it easier for people to come in and be there in the street. We take an, an idea from Amsterdam where repopulate part of the high street with living accommodation so you get less crime and more activity there and that, that will help as well. The problem is upward only rent increases in the sense it's the accepted model of particularly in this country whereby any rent review is upward and etc. The problem there is the banks are owners of the properties in most cases and for a bank to allow the value of well not to go in for upward only rent reviews etc and have that revenue stream in any way dilute it means it challenges the value of assets in their balance sheet which means they then have to put more of their cash into the mix in terms of the authorities monitoring the, the, the viability of the bank so they will never give up that one and will let companies go bust and have empty premises there not producing anything. The governments, I think, have to crack that one open and, and just stop that happening, you know. But the idea would be that when Amazon gets to a certain point, they then begin to think, well, I can do retail as well. And they're doing that with the Whole Foods learning the huge costs and the waste issues and all the other aspects of that. But we'll do enough of it in the right place because of their knowledge of habit an appetite in various places and that they can capitalize on that the problem is then getting too big and swinging into areas they know nothing about deep down and uh, so the model will not stretch that far but we will have enough of a stimulus in the high street to have that energy coming from 
startup businesses, innovation, etc., etc. Some well-established names, lots of charity shops and other things, and people walking around, which will be the bigger thing, who live upstairs in some of the shops. So, so I see it's going to be a huge change. The issue will be, can we, as a service provider, make money out of that population? What do we know about them? How can we encourage them to stay in our street rather than someone else's, etc.? So to my mind, very basic business premise and idea just needs to be thought through by these people and work out the money and just see what can be done in these circumstances. But for sure, the ones doing that first have the innovators' advantage, as you know, and can uh, plow on and be successful, I think. It's a matter of style and other issues, but uh, basically I see small companies doing that more flexibly than others, but they don't have the scale advantage of purchasing quantity, etc. So that can be an issue for them as well. One of the things I've observed and I, one of the things I believe in as well, if you start to look at, let's say you have a, a restaurant business and you start to look at it a bit like a Swiss army knife, mm-hmm. there's different challenges you can make money. You can make money on your special ingredients yes, around sure. your sauce. A very good example here for Brighton yeah. is uh, beef rice. Yes, yeah, sure. So they sell French fries mm-hmm. and then they have the sauce range and they have a beer range. Yes, yeah, sure. So they suddenly, and they sell these jars online in the mm-hmm. online shop. Yes, yeah, sure. They also do delivery now. Yes, yeah, sure. So they build more revenue streams around their yeah, model sure. to make yeah. sure they're not only depending on one revenue stream but yeah, actually sure. can hit people with different things because they already have the trust as a you know yeah. a local place that's a lot of good hype about them sure. when you look at social media and so on but then they're starting building ranges of other things mm-hmm. there's no doubt about smaller operators you can see that they're doing that instead yeah. of exta- expanding the estate which is actually yeah. property which you just said is very difficult because <laughs> the bank is involved yes, indeed, yeah. and it's difficult to source and get the right rent and make yeah. the money work people start to think, how can I actually develop my business? How can I use a half-empty hotel to co-working during the day? Yeah, sure. How can I create a, my <coughs> hotel lobby into a coffee shop? Yes, indeed. And, and, and be more creative about what you already have and utilize. And open-minded. And basically, the longer one is in business, the more confidence one has in that particular way and more reluctant one is to actually change and do something different radically to them. I think the whole thing is the numbers. You say, basically, what do I want? On an annual basis in terms of return on capital, at what rate of increase am I have an appetite for that degree of risk to quantify everything? And it doesn't sound terribly sexy, but the idea of just being very money conscious and then go back to the creativity, having sorted out the basis of it. And then it determined, is this an ego trip where I want extra branches or have my name and lights around the town? All very distracting. The key is the core business. What business are we in? and what we really want to change and will be changed to make room for us and then just do it that way but with a, an argument that can convince a lender, a bank properly, but a shareholders or whatever. But it, it's the only way that works in the given situation now of where everyone is hypersensitive to the idea of return on investment in the manner of speaking. To be able to talk that language convincingly I feel helps in that respect know what your your value is to other people and quantify it, you know, and deliver. To create return of investment also, I guess there will be people that will hit the, the savings mm. and look at the P&Ls and say, where can we cut costs, yeah, and sure. squeeze the lemon and <coughs> uh, maybe almost put all the juice out of the business. Mm. Will they be needed to do that to survive and then there will be a natural death mm. of you know the the pool of competitors yeah. and then yeah. the, the the strongest will survive and that's where we stand maybe in five years time cutting costs is always to get breeding space once it becomes an end in itself the business is destroyed you begin to shortchange the customer covertly or otherwise it doesn't matter but they soon tell if they're not getting as much as they were getting the cutting is just to give you room to find investment opportunities invest in things that you think are going to work and have the courage to try it etc etc the way of the future the ones that are successful are those who can strip out on essentials investments and management ego we used to call it many years ago that just became add-ons to the business because we were there and the relatives or uh, other people within the business thought it was a good idea at the time again a reason long since redundant he is is to sit down and say what real business are we in and how does it compare to what we think is the requirement or need of these people we're expecting to pay for it 
and what are they prepared to pay and can they get equivalent from someone else. So realistic view of potential competition, realistic view of a person's willingness to pay and ability because what's happened with the 2008 recession is they've all still got the ambition in the world but they're strapped for cash. So then that the ante goes up in terms of what you have to offer in that respect and can get help them with. It. So huge issue for them. To my mind it's all about viability. The patisserie, Valerie, was a very interesting case study where a company became very, very big very quickly, as always has to be a question of caution there. Then as money became tighter in the business, the prices rose, they're now at a level that people begin to say, do I really need to pay X for that cake along with my coffee, etc.? At that point, that was challenged. At the same time, business rates and people stopped eating out. People are now making do. In other words, they're saying, we used to go out three evenings a week and have a nice meal, etc., etc. If they say, right, because we're cutting back, let's drop one of those evenings. If the population does that, you've just taken one third out of the eating out market, you know. The same way with people buying cars, which were meant to, after every two years, you needed a new car in the company. That's three years without the thing breaking down, maybe four years of a push, maybe five years. I've now taken half of the market for cars, new cars out. So people are getting a sense of... What makes sense? Does it sound sensible to me? Let's run the numbers and have a look and come to a conclusion. Well, no, I, there are different ways of spending the little I have left, you know. And whether it's a home delivery of a meal rather than going out. Nice to be out, but nevertheless, maybe just once a week we have a bottle of wine with the difference. People will cut costs out of that model enough to constantly make it more attractive if you're delivery to order up at home with one click ordering hopefully delivery predictably within 20 minutes or whatever meanwhile the restaurant is still a terrific place to go but now for more special occasions and we need to make every occasion special in that the experience they have is worth the difference in money and going out you know that's what has to happen i think often what you say is when you know hospitality retail and construction start yeah. to see a slowdown yeah. that's the early signs yeah. of downturn Mm. Let's not call it a recession, let's mm. just call it a downturn. Nobody yeah, knows okay. what's going to yeah. happen. Is that what's going to happen as well on top of, you know, retail that have a hard time? They're already trying now to adjust and stuff mm. like that. Are you seeing, you know, in, in general that, that this is going to happen? That, that everybody tried, when you see the news, or mm. finance news, everybody tried to avoid to talk about it. They say, well, everything is fine. Uh, we've gone up year on year. We're still growing. There's still prospects for growing the, the, the mm. economy. Is it, is it again, you know, we are trying to lie to ourselves and yeah. then there's going to be a big hit around the corner? Yeah, I think there is, but then it's so politically incorrect to express that, yeah. so it's in everybody's interest to talk it up. To my mind, one loses touch with reality. When 2008 occurred, I was personally saying, right, two years, this I didn't dare say three years because of the expectation of people who listen to me. I said, but now I can ring them up and say, well, five years went, and now 10 years, okay, 2018. And, and the, can you please stomach the idea of this with the uncertainty of Brexit and other things, another five years? Just budget for that. If it's better, it'll be a bonus. Act as if that's going to be the case. So then put in all the disciplines into your business to make the most of the bit of money you have available and just go for it like that. And then, as I say, as it lifts, you're probably the best prepared than anybody to then rise with it and stay ahead. Whereas most people in this type of environment are sitting on their hands waiting for it to get back to normal so they can recognise patterns and do normal things. And the cliché, cliché, this is normal. If you get used to that, you speak to young kids of 18, 20 years of age, they've never known anything other than flat lines in 2008. There were babies in those days. Yeah. And uh, they will go into business now and start up things that more experienced people like myself say, you haven't got a hope in hell, would never express it. I'm very interested in what they're doing. But in practice, they don't know how risky it is. They don't see the holes in the road. And we need whole slug of those people to keep it going and one way or another they would odd ones will strike real pay dirt and a lot of them would be moderately successful they have ambitions that are tied to reality rather than our age old when everything that's where the growth will come 
all I caution them to do is, as I say, count as you're going along. You learn a lot from figures and um, just do the good stuff, you know, and that works very well indeed, you know. What are the three biggest things you think that has changed? Basically, I keep referring to but the savvy consumer. It was not, inverted commas, posh to ask about the cost of anything, and particularly this UK culture for years. You're now challenging, luckily, the doctors, the judges, the police, politicians like never before. Equally, when you don't like what comes on the plate, when you saw the menu description of it, and say, no way, I'm, and I'm not paying for it either. They don't make the legal mistake of saying I'm not paying at all, I pay a pound for that. Now publicise me in the local paper if you dare. But that's all, it was rubbish. It takes an awful lot of moral courage. You can do it easier when you're on your own and don't have a family there to be embarrassed. So my own family are well schooled in me objecting when it's absolutely necessary. And they equally in turn do that. So that's the difference. People are now looking, what we used to call a gift horse in the mouth. They will see the length of the teeth of the horse and will challenge things. Because it is their money, it's hard won. They don't have an awful lot to spare. So they're not going to be, if you like, conned just because someone aggressively or nicely or persuasively says, it's fine, trust me, I'm a doctor. Ridiculous. And that was the most heartening thing that's occurred. So now we're talking about realists out there doing business with other realists. And they find a way that accommodates both on a fair share basis. Is there other things that's going to happen over the next two years? Government intervention, always one avoids the idea of a Brexit and this, but it is colouring everything we're talking about. We we'll have to sit down and watch for the viability of, a, I feel like, a single currency and with plenty of arguments to support or uh, deny that. Governments are strapped for cash, so they will look at different ways of getting tax from people and businesses, etc., who will, will then, as they cause problems in terms of what the future there is in other people. One thing I'd like to touch, touch on, because I like the whole idea of the hospitality interview, for one reason alone, which is a pet subject, but nevertheless, I think with restaurants, the final experience one has in a restaurant is, in fact, would you believe the cup of coffee? And that's the lasting experience and the thing I remember when I leave the premises and want to go back. A lot of hospitality establishments will, in fact, cut costs on the coffee. And coffee as an ingredient, 30p a cup, I bet any of them buying reasonably could buy it at 10p a cup. And to begin to even think of cutting costs on that basis, the McDonald's success would be about quality coffee more than the rest of the offering, I would suggest. <laughs> okay, So if I can uh, leave that restaurant with superbly made coffee as my lasting impression, I would then begin to talk and say, do the tell a friend idea in that respect. And the one vulnerability I've seen time and again, I do not, in most of my restaurant visits, uh, socially, I just refuse to take the coffee course, knowing that it is, from the smell it will be the cooked style, to say, not right in my book. And um, it's crazy that they do this. That's one message I would like to leave with some of these guys, you know, as a consumer. It's quite spot on what you see there because actually when we work with operators, yeah, sure. one of the things we add on to their their string of bow in, from a sales point of view, how to optimize your coffee offering, oh, lovely. Is, is the coffee bit because that's actually you already have them in there. The amount of coffee that has been drinking and yeah. especially if you can do a really good sure. quality after a yeah. meal, yeah. It's, it's a very European thing that's come into the UK, can mm. be massive and then often people miss that opportunity. Oh, yeah. And I, one thing I learned from my mom, Doran, restaurant business through the yes, years sir. and uh, what's that is how you start and you end the visit yeah sure yeah the bills the loyalty of course yeah. we can make mistake in yeah, between yeah. well if we correct them and then make sure that whatever dessert or coffee yeah. they get and goodbye yes indeed we are safe home of course without a doubt except that you made a mistake and you actually have build loyalty with them because of you course, actually yeah. correct that yeah. and many many that's why they try to make the savings on yes them. Because then I or they keep yeah. the price up there and then put a worse quality product yeah, in indeed. it would be milk it would be coffee yeah. it could be coffee machine yeah, maintenance so yeah so we, we see that all the time so that's a that's a perfect good example in the end of the podcast Brian we always ask the the people on if they can get like one advice yeah sure and we can put the retail hospitality hat on I think leaders in these industries have the same challenges so what, what is the one thing they should do? Apart from counting the money, I'm taking that yeah. as a given. 
The other one, I think in these circumstances, the way people are communicating, they're not reading normal media and watching TV, etc., 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 and your future as millennials, etc., would be to think deeply about to tell a friend, to try to persuade people that basically the experience was so good to tell perhaps two friends rather than one, and that will double the propagation of the message from existing times, etc., and for sure do not disappoint them because then you're on the other end of the scale with uh, going to, let us say, minimum 10 people with a complaint. If you just see it as golden opportunity you mentioned earlier, actually getting someone to come from a home or work and sit in your establishment and captive audience and you have perhaps an hour, hour and a half to really convert them into loyal users is something that the FMCG guys never get to express except with uh, special interest groups and other expensive mechanisms. In a restaurant you have that as a given and to then treat them badly, have bad lighting or good lighting depending on what they expect to have to look after them without in any way no one wants servile but service would be a very useful ingredient and just make them out and say you're guaranteed if you come back again you'll get more of this and it can't fail with value for money added on it becomes compelling I would suggest I think that was a, a very good advice thank you very much for coming here on the Hospitality you, Memory Michael. podcast I'm sure we're going to catch up in the, in the if not the coming two years but before that That's true. when things are moving along in the both the retail and hospitality industry good a great pleasure Michael thank you very much wow Brian that was quite an hour and thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories and thoughts around where the high street is today and where our beloved high street is going to go in the future. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share or even better rate us on iTunes. Thank you, Laura, from Let's Talk Video Production for making another podcast happy. We hope you enjoyed today's Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingsa. Tune in next time for another industry interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.